You're listening to Make the Game with Matt Hackett. Welcome to Make the Game. My name is Matt Hackett. Today we are talking about productivity. I want you to make your video games faster and better. Uh, I don't know about titles. Become more productive by removing decision paralysis or maybe the power of limitations. I don't know what we're going with yet, but something along those lines, right? Um, so you can always move quicker in your game, right? You can always uh, do tasks more efficiently. And one of the core ways to do that is through limitations or, or constraints, right? So here's the general rule of thumb when I'm working on a game is... If I have to ask myself what in the world I I should do to complete a task, that's bad. But if I have to ask myself, which among these few things do I have to do to complete the task? So let's let's talk about this. Um, If your decision is infinite, that's bad, right? If it's like, I want to add a new entity to my game and you could do it in any way imaginable, that's not good. If your decision is constrained, that's good. If it's more like if your system is, say, here's how an entity is made. Here's the one way to do it. That's what you want, right? Or if it's like, even if there's two or three ways to do it, that's better than, I don't know, it's never been done before, you know, good luck, have fun, right? So anytime you're working on your game, if you hit that where you're like, you know, um, I don't know what it should be, you, you need limitations. Um, let's take a quote actually from someone else. You'd be able to hear a voice other than mine for once. Um, that's exciting. So this is a, a quote from Joe Winter, developer of Song of Iron. Um, from a talk uh, on YouTube, I'll link to it in the show notes, uh, solo development, myths, reality, and survival strategies. This is a great talk because it has the perspective from a bunch of different developers. Um, but let's, let's hear this quote. Said this limits will set you free. I think as any solo developer, we really have to understand that, um, we have limitations. We only can do so much. There's only one of us. So it's really important to do this really early on. So if you don't, uh, take it from me, take it from Joe, that <clears throat> limitations uh, will set you free. They are great. Let's talk about one of the most um, obvious, um, visual, and probably most used limitations that I think a lot of you listening to this are going to be familiar with. So um, palettes, right? A color palette. Um, these these are great. Th- these, these really do um, empower you. They come with multiple benefits. If you're not familiar, so a palette is really just a uh, a series of color values, right? And it can walk the gamut. Um, when you, if you've ever heard of a one-bit game, that's sort of a palette, right? Because it's it's black and white or whatever colors you assign to that, but it's kind of a Boolean way of looking at it, right? Um, going up the ramp a little bit, there's um, very small color palettes like a, you know, Game Boy, right? Like classic Game Boy. So it was the four shades of gray. Was it? Was it five? I think it was four, but it was so um, simple, right? Like if you were to ask yourself, you know, what color should this sprite be? You are not going to get completely lost. You're not going to be, you know, looking through 16 million colors through uh, through Photoshop or something, right? Like you're going to choose among those four. Um, going right up that ladder, I use a 16-bit, uh, sorry, a 16-color palette um, called the Dawnbringer palette. There's also a 32-color um, version of that palette, and um, they're both great. There's one of my favorites that I tell people about um, is a palette called, um, well, the palette used in UFO 50, um, a game from Moss Mouth and Friends. And uh, it's a really great palette it's inspired by um, classic Nintendo Entertainment System. It's another 32 color palette. Here's some advice, just, um, you know, rough, rough, and, uh, rough and tough rule. If, if you are picking a palette, don't go higher than 32. I don't think that you need to. I mean, every game is different, you know, but uh, the nice thing about palettes is they don't just... Um, help you make decisions more quickly they also add cohesion to your game right like if you're going around with a with a color picker and you've got you know a hundred different blues in your game you start to suffer you know, consistency wise right but if you're if you only have the one or the two uh colors that represent blue in your game that's great um here's a quote from um my friend vincent so let's see if I, am i organized enough do i have this do i have it where is it no i'm not Um, this came from the discord. Oh, by the way, I'll put a link to the discord. Come hang out. Um, discord. It's a bunch of, uh, it's myself. I'm always hanging out in there. Your own, uh, Jeff Blair from LDG is in there. Lots of LDG friends. Um, here is the quote from Vincent. I am organized enough. Look at that. So 
I find that a smaller palette drastically improves my ability to churn out pixel art. So true. And then Plane Puncher couldn't have been made with more colors. So Plane Puncher, uh, Vincent's game, check it out. It's on itch.io. It's got that classic Game Boy um, palette and uh, the game is done. And uh, Vincent says it would not have been made if it were even, even five colors. No, okay. Um, you know, it, like that's, that's a big stretch, right? Like from four colors to 16 colors, you are quadrupling the decision you have to make about, you know, what color should this plane be or whatnot. Um, moving on from palettes, how about assets? Every single asset in your game has potential for you to kind of get lost and get tangled up in the weeds of like, every time you're working on a new asset, there's possibility for you to get tangled up in uh, the size of it, the resolution, um, how does it get made, who's going to make it. And assets include things like um, sprites, sound effects, music, 3D models, all that good stuff. Um, let me talk a little bit about like things like size matter a lot, right? Like if you're working on a, like a retro game, you know, you might have 16 by 16 um, tiles. It might be a kind of a no brainer for you, but if you're working on a high def game, a lot of times, you know, you can kind of get lost. Like how big is that sprite? It could be literally any size, right? Um, let me talk a little bit about indie game sim, which is a game. I don't, I don't talk much about it. Um, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. It's, it's, you know, it's a pixel platformer. Um, it was made right before there was a billion of those. There was only a million when I made mine. Um, little known game. Uh, I'm real proud of it. Here are some things I use to help me finish it, right? Because that game took me about six months. And again, you can't argue with the fact that it's finished. You know, not the greatest game ever, but um, I can point at it as, 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 a, as an accomplishment. And I use the Dawnbringer 16 um, color palette in it. I used 16 by 16 tiles. Um, the resolution was very uh, constrained. It was 256 by um, 144, inspired by classic uh, Nintendo, but kind of modernized a little bit. Um, the music is interesting in this one. I'm going to talk about music um, and, and limitations and stuff, but uh, I just used Joshua Morris's music, and I'll link to Joshua's um, music in the show notes. I'm sure I will be doing a lot of that. Um, this was music that was done, you know, and it was the kind of the equivalent of finding like a, an asset pack you really like, you know, through Humble or the Unity Asset Store or something. Um, but it's like, it's from a friend of mine. It's, it's amazing. I, I, I literally listened to the music. Um, it's from this uh, series of waveform albums. I love it. And he didn't mind me putting it in there. Um, it didn't cost me a penny. It's, it's almost like that was almost perfect, right? Um, the only thing you could possibly do better is if you had, you know, music made custom for your game. But I mean, think about this, like nobody, almost nobody, maybe like a dozen people who, who like listen to the show and stuff, uh, recognize that that music was not original to the game. You know, the vast majority of people who play indie game sim will likely never have heard that music before and will totally appreciate it in that context. So it totally works. Um, the sound effects for indie game sim were exclusively made with a tool called BFXer. Um, I, I think that this is pretty well known at this stage in an in indie game world, but I'm gonna put a link to it anyway. BFXer, it's such a cool tool. Um, here's a tip though, is so you open up BFXer and um, whether you use a downloadable version or you just use it on the website, either way it works. It's, um, it's one of these tools that has a million little levers and knobs and it's kind of hard to tell how you get something good out of it. So um, here's some advice, just hit the randomize button. Random, random, random. You'll get uh, like beep, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> perfect, perfect sounding sounds for me, right? But you'll get a bunch of random sounds and you'll find some that are just cool. Like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. you'll get a cool one. You go, hey, that's nice. If it's, here's your rule of thumb. If the, mu if the sound is satisfying enough to where you can play it rapidly, you know, for a few seconds in a row, then ship it. It's good enough. It's wing, 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 wing. If it's, you know, if it's, if it's irritating, you, you'll find some sounds like that, especially if you're just doing the randomized, you'll find some that are, you know, like glaring, like, ah, get out of my ear, right? Um, just skip those and then save the ones you like. That's how I did it with Indie Game Sim. I, I found a bunch of sounds. I wasn't planning to find specific sounds. I was just using the randomizer and I'd be like, oh, that's nice. And then I end up using it later. Um, music is is a pretty big one. I don't have a ton to say about it because um, I don't make, I want to someday. I, have, I haven't really um, made the whole soundtrack for one of my games. Um, music's a tough one because 
like, okay, I think a lot of us are probably just going to go, like, this is what I'm doing now. I'm kind of going to some packages and just downloading um, some songs I like and that I think fit the atmosphere. And I try to keep it cohesive. Um, it's a really affordable way to do that, right? It only costs me a few bucks um, per song because I buy them in bulk and stuff. Um, sometimes, though, you want to make your own music or you want to work with a composer. And here are some tips to keep your... Um, limitations in check and to help you move quickly, right? So uh, music, again, is like infinite. You could use any instrument in the world. You could have any, you know, beats per minute. It's just overwhelming, right? You could have a hundred tracks, meaning, you know, drums and bass and violin and, you know, uh, xylophone and marimba. There's just no end to it. So what you can do, though, is you can kind of pretend as if... Um, either your composer or yourself, is like a little band, right? And instead of any instrument in the world, you have like, well, okay, I've got Michelle over here on drums, and she just has her drum kit that she loves, and her drums sound amazing, and they work with any song, so ship it. That's our drum situation. And then we've got, you know, uh, Steve over here <clears throat> loves guitar, and he can change the tone, and he's got different guitar pedals he can use, but he's just going to play electric guitar, right? And you can kind of look at that way with your own music, where, you know, okay, here's, here's the five, maybe ten instruments I'm going to use, and that's it. I'm not going to go outside of this instrument set. And that will make your music sound cohesive. And that will also um, help you make decisions quicker, right? Um, genre. You could stick within the same genre. You could say, we're going to have nothing but, you know, uh, up-tempo bops in this, you know. Or it's going to be nothing but, you know, orchestral, moody music for this game. Um, I think length is a big one, too, for music. Like, uh Spelunky, Spelunky. It's been zero episodes since I've talked about Spelunky. Um, the original Spelunky HD um, had really cool music that was like each track was about a minute long and it looped. And the songs were so dynamic that you didn't even really notice that that was happening. You know what I mean? It would just they would just loop and sound really cool. Um, so you know, don't go crazy with length. Like if you're making your own music, do you need a five minute song or even a three minute song? You know, you might be able to get away with something really short and then loop it. Okay, so music is not my expertise, although I love it, and I talk about it a lot, and I got a brand new song at the end of this podcast you can use in your own project. It's pretty fun. It's a pretty cool one. I think you'll like it. Um, I think that really what matters most when you're talking about adding limitations to your project to speed up your productivity is it's all about your content pipeline. It really is, because you know your game is going to be filled with systems and user interface and, and game design and stuff, but like the meat of your game is kind of like, you know, picture this big, delicious burger. Your buns end up being pretty small, and your meat is gigantic, or, you know, whatever vegetables, whatever whatever you want to put in there, the filling. Um, and so you need your content pipeline to be really smooth. So think about your process for a new thing. If you want to add a new thing to your game, whatever a thing is for you, is it an entity? Uh, do you want to add a new level? Do you want to add an obstacle, um, a room, etc.? Um, anything along these lines where you're making the content for your game is an area where you can get lost with decision paralysis, right? So here's, here are some ways to find out how to like smooth out and speed up your content pipeline. Do every task in your content pipeline, make everything, make a, make a room, make a, make a puzzle, make whatever completes one like content chunk in your game, right? Like if you're making a Castlevania game, make one you know, nearly complete first level. Um, if you're making a Metroidvania, do the same thing, but don't like tie everything together. Just make one chunk. If, if it's an RPG, make one, you know, monster battle in one little town, village, or whatever that is. Make the thing. Um, measure the length of each task, right? And then compare that to the other tasks. So you might notice like, hey, you know, it's really quick for me to add a new hero. I just add a new sprite and I give them a name and then I add a stats file and that's it. But then you might notice like, okay, adding a monster is actually a pain because I have to update this gigantic sprite atlas and I have to run the script to, to redo the atlas data. And then there's these three files I have to add for a monster because there's the data, then there's the data that ties it to which battle system it needs to be in and yada, 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 right? So find those areas and then smooth them out, basically, right? You want to like clear the runway as if you're... Um, like a plane coming in to land. You know, you don't want a lot, a lot of clutter there, things to get caught up on. Um, one question to avoid is, um, 
Should I refactor this? Now, this is a tough one, right? Because I, I used to refactor like crazy, but that was really just me spinning my wheels. These days, I'm more like only refactor if you gotta. And, and that's, oh, do you gotta? Like what, what kind of rule is that? It's hard, right? So here's a more concrete one is refactor if it's slowing you down, right? And, and you can also even like, you can guesstimate how long is this refactor going to take me and then apply what would I get out of this refactor, right? Like if you're noticing, you know, your content pipeline, it takes you, you know, five times longer to make a, a level than you feel like it should, and your refactor would take you a day, you can kind of do that math and be like, okay, if I do this refactor, you know, it's going to cost me a day, but then that will buy me, you know, 10 days over the next few months. So that makes it worth it. So think about your content pipeline and, you know, games are so big and nebulous. Like, I don't know what exactly your content pipeline looks like, but examine it and apply those limitations. Okay. All right. So, um, We've gotten through kind of the, the easy stuff. So here's the next hard part, which is uh, the code. Oh, the code. Code, like source code, you know, C Sharp, JavaScript, C++, like, you know, Python, whatever whatever you're writing for your game. Um, and I don't know, the, maybe this is, this is probably still applicable if you're using Blueprints or another visual scripting language like Flow Canvas or something. It's, it's probably still uh, applicable, but... The thing about programming is like it's it's much harder to give yourself limitations, but it is uh, still possible, right? Um, so I'm going to include some quotes again. Um, this one's from Lost Cast 250, uh, where Jeff and I are talking about this podcast, make the game, uh, but also uh, entity component systems. Um, so let's hear from Jeff. But something I've been finding in my code is that there's a lot of advantages in general just to keeping that hard separation. like. As an example, um, this latest iteration of the game engine that I'm working on is no classes whatsoever, none, zero, absolutely mm. not. That is like one of my hard and fast rules because when I started thinking down this road about really separating state from behavior, I always kept getting back to this point where it's like, well, how do classes fit into this mix? Because by definition, they are a pairing of state and behavior, right? Like mm, that's yeah. their purpose. And so in this kind of mental model that I have for this kind of an ECS architecture, it just, those constructs don't add any value. And in fact, they only confuse things, right? Because if you just say, hey, don't use classes, right? That kind of puts you more on rails, right? Where it's like, okay, well, classes are not allowed in this code base because that is not part of the architecture. Um, and then you don't mm. even get down that path of like, Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna add a little private member variable here, and uh, here's a little function that accesses it. It's like no, none, none of that. Right. So uh, you can kind of tell you, you can kind of write your code in a way that um, sets you up for success, right? And um, here's a quote from myself where I say uh, something very similar. Like that's that's kind of what when you talk about architecture. You know, you picture lots of things in your mind, like code conventions and, and, and stuff. But like a lot of it is just trying to, to get people to behave and get along, you know, and like the bigger your team is, the harder that is to do. But even with a team of one, like I, I spend a lot of time obsessing with architecture and a lot of time just because like I know I'm going to be a stupid, lazy idiot later and be like, I'm just going to put this here. And you almost do want your architecture to be like, I'm going to make that hard for you. Like you shouldn't put that there and you know it. And it'd be easier to do it the right way. You know, like a lot of, a lot of, yeah, a lot of architecture is really like human psychology, I guess. Is quoting yourself uh, a really narcissistic thing to do? I think it is. So make the narcissist with Matt Hackett. So when you're looking at your source code, you really want to like assume that you're going to try to do the wrong thing at some point and you want to set yourself up for success, right? Your content should be good and fast. Uh, your content pipeline, as we talked about, but you've also got to look at other stuff when you're thinking about your source code, right? Because your code is in every single element of your game. So it's extra important. Um, look at the title screen, right? Is it clear where you would add credits? Is it clear where you'd add settings? Let's say you're play testing your game and uh, like a, somebody requests a new setting like contrast or lighting. Do you know where that would go? Do you have a menu? Can you add options to your menu? Is it easy to hide your menu? What if you need to spin up a new type of menu, right? 
So when we talk about content pipeline, we are talking about the meat of your game. But, you know, don't forget the other stuff. The other quality of life, user interface, that stuff all matters. And if you are kind of getting lost on the, um, the code aspect, I would recommend a game jam, as I always do. Do a game jam, um, include the things that you're struggling with, and just bang them out, right? And get that first or second or third stab out, and it's just going to be not as good as you want. Get the game jam done, and then when you go back to working on a bigger game, um, you're going to be more prepared. Okay. Um, here's a big one. I think we're kind of wrapping this up, and uh, and this is this is a pretty cool, useful thing. So, talking about cohesion, you know, we kind of got that. And we talked earlier about the the palette makes your game look more cohesive, and um, using a consistent tool like BFXer can make your sound effects sound more cohesive. Um, here's a way to uh, to make your content more cohesive. So, uh, I'm going to put a link to this. You should really check it out. At least give it a little browse. This is the Dota 2 Workshop Character Art Guide by Valve. Um, Dota 2 is uh, Defenders of the Ancients. This is a really popular uh, game from Valve. It's in it's in the, the same genre as League of Legends. Um, so I'm sure you've heard of that one if you have, even haven't heard of Dota 2. Um, Valve released this really great uh, style guide. Have a look, man. Dota 2 Workshop Character Art Guide. Uh, so here, here's some great tips that it, that it, that it provides, right? Silhouette must be clearly identifiable at a glance. That's great. And you know... If you're not familiar with the silhouette, it's kind of like the um, the outline of an object. Like if, like my favorite example is Mickey Mouse. If you see those three circles, you know you're probably thinking of Mickey Mouse. And um, with Dota two, they try to have a, a consistent outline for each character, consistent um, silhouette. And then let's uh, let's go through the rest of these quickly. Um, value gradients and patterning for colors, colors color and saturation schemes, missing uh, mixing mixing colors. Um, Areas of rest and detail, um, and a whole lot more. And, you know, this doesn't just provide cohesion. This provides uh, limitations to remove your decision paralysis. Um, also, with the style guide, you know, there's a lot of people working on uh, Dota 2, um, especially when you include the workshop stuff. So it's extra important for collaboration, right? And uh, that's another thing these restrictions can help you with is, you know, if you're a solo dev for me, it can help you um, just stay consistent. And if you're uh, working on a team, it can help your team stay on the same page, which is really valuable. Okay, we're starting to wrap it up. Um, I hope this has helped. Uh, just remember, whenever you're sitting down to make your game, if you are questioning what you should do or how you should complete a task, take a step back and think, do I need to apply more limitations to this? Is, is the question I'm trying to ask too infinite? You know what I mean? Like, which of these infinite things could it be? It's just too hard of a question. Instead, you want it to be like, which of these five things? Which of these nine things? You know, even, even which of these 100 things is better than which of these infinite things. So just try to apply those limitations to yourself. Um, questions. So, you know, you can always, uh, you can always email. You can reach, uh, reach me on uh, Twitter slash Richtor. You can reach me on Discord, um, which I idle in all day. Um, you can also ask audio questions, which is pretty cool. You know, we never had this on Lost Cast. It's almost like a call-in show. Um, some questions that came up from Discord, I just want to cover real quick. Uh, this, this is kind of funny, actually. Chess being a simple game. Um, I know it's not simple uh, to play. In my mind, maybe I'm just a person who's been programming video games for 30 years. Like, it's probably been 30 years since I wrote my first chess game. Um, writing the game is pretty simple. I really do think that. Like, if you're talking about a complete chess game with AI and everything. It is very complicated. But uh, I've worked on uh, multiple chess games uh, that didn't even have um, artificial intelligence, you know, online multiplayer or something. Here's an interesting thing, though. I just I just wanted... This is completely random. Kind of a tangent, but um, it's related to this, I promise. When I was growing up in the, in the mid-90s, Magic the Gathering was really popular, right? And the internet didn't uh, have much for you at the time. There was no Magic the Gathering game. There wouldn't be one for a long, long time. Um, so a friend of mine, um, Jim, who introduced me to QBasic and got me started on this path. Jim's the reason you're listening to my voice right now. Um, he made a Magic the Gathering game you could play over TCP IP on Windows. And it was mind-blowing. And, like, it had um, cards in it. You know, you can make your own deck and stuff. And you might be wondering, like, how in the world... He was probably 14 or something at the time. How did he make that? Um, he completely cheated. There's no Magic the Gathering rules in his game. It's left up to you, the player. What he gave you is a canvas and a little chat box and the ability to do things like tap cards and add counters. And that's it. And so, um, you know, that's how chess is played in real life, right? If you're sitting down at a chessboard, you're not sitting there and um, 
you don't need something to calculate everything that's happening. You've got your human brains to do that. And if someone cheats, you've got the other player right there um, to keep them fair, right? And so um, we we were able to play Magic the Gathering online. It was crazy. Um, just such a such a clever thing to just kind of skip those rules entirely. I love it. Like the easiest way to get something done is to say no and just not do it. But it's still done. It, it's genius. I love it. Um, Another quick question is, uh, why call it saturation? Previous podcast episode, um, we talked about um, doing a saturation analysis on your game where you kind of look through all of its capabilities and see what all it could easily do uh, to help you add new content and find new hooks. And I just I just love it. I think it's hard to explain. It took me 25 minutes to explain that thing. But um, do, uh, do that on your design. Seriously, you will learn something. So um, why call it saturation? I thought about some other terms like... Uh, I'm pretty sure Jeff and I came up with this while talking together. We maybe things came up like flood fill. Um, to me, for saturation, I like like have you looked? Is is is, is, is kind of what comes to mind? Like, have you done the saturation? Um, let's look at the the definition of saturation. To a very full extent, especially <clears throat> beyond the point regarded as necessary or desirable. And I think that's appropriate here because. As we talked about in the episode, as you saturate your game design and see what all it can do, you know, you're going to find some things that are not necessary. And I think that you will definitely find some things that aren't even desirable. You'll find like, whoa, you know, if I change these settings in my game, you know, everything, everything explodes really easily. I don't want that. But it's kind of neat. And now that you know it can do that, um, it empowers you. Uh, a couple of Audio questions are in the queue. Uh, thanks for sending those in. I will get to those um, in future episodes. You can ask your own question at Anchor FM, Anchor.fm. And you can always go to Vladria.com slash make the game. You are being played out by Desert Fox by Raphael Crux, which you can find and use in your own projects at FreePD.com.